I request our principal sir to formally welcome uh, Mrs. Bob Miller, our uh, guest of the day. Uh, sir, please. You can yeah. note and. Yeah. Mrs. Barbara Miller from the United States of America and veteran of Kendri Vidya Lea Kanjikod, Srimadhi Rukmini Menon, presently in the United States of America. Mr. Mujib Rahman, the host of this meeting. And my dear students of Kendri Vidya Lea Kanjikod, fellow teachers of Kendri Vidya Lea Kanjikod, good morning to you all here in India. And good evening to Mrs. Barbara and Mrs. Rukmini Menon, who are presently in the United States of America. I am very happy and privileged to have such an interaction here with such a veteran, a doyen in the field of teaching of English, who is familiar with Kendri Vidya Lea Kanji Code for last so many years. She happened to be the close friend of Rukmini Menon, and through her, she knows our, our school and our students. And I don't think that there is a great introduction is required as far as Mrs. Barbara Miller is concerned. Anyway, Mrs. Rukmini Menon is going to formally introduce her to you all. So I am not going to venture into that. But I know she has been spending her precious time with passion for teaching of English in different stages, different levels from middle grade students to pre-training, in-service training, and different types of learning to the teaching of English. Anyway, her topic today is signposts, signposts in fiction to build comprehension. So better comprehension through signboards. And I am not intervening in her topic. We are awaiting for a detailed discussion and interaction with the students. As the principal of this Kendri Vidyalaya, I have great pleasure and privilege to welcome you amongst us. And I hope that this relationship will continue in the years to come also. So welcome to Kendri Vidyalaya once again, Ms. Barbara Miller. So uh, Mrs. Rukmini Menon, who is on long leave with her some personal uh, commitments in the United States of America. As a grandmother, she is very busy but her first passion and first love is teaching of English. That's why in spite of her uh, commitments as a grandmother, she found time for the conducting such a function. You are welcome back to Kendriya Vidyalaya, madam. We miss you for long. Anyway, we wish you a happy stay in the United States of America for the remaining days. Welcome back to Kendriya Vidyalaya, Kanji Kaur. Thank you, sir. Uh, hi, Bob, and uh, everyone there at uh, KV Kanjikot, members of the KV Kanjikot family. Um, it's really nice to see the faces that I've missed for the last uh, three months, right? Okay, so here, uh, so, before I read out uh, the profile of... Okay, okay, okay. Yes, sir? No, no, welcome to all uh, part other participants also that you continue. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, uh, before I go into the profile of uh, Mrs. Barbara Miller, I'll um, just give a personal introduction, how we had met, where we had met, and um, then how she had come to India and what had happened there. Right. Now, it was at the end program of the Fulbright Fellowship that I met uh, Bob, I call her Bob, she calls me Maya, that's my pet name. Uh, so uh, it was uh, in the US that we had met. And she told me uh, during the meeting that uh, she had opted for India. So she was one of the host teachers and she had opted for India and secretly I prayed that I would be able to host her. In fact, there were 11 of us from India and I was not sure whether I would get barred because there were uh, three or four more teachers who had opted for India. But as luck would have it, Barb came to Palaka. Barb was selected and I was supposed to host her. And she came to Palaka, all the way to Palaka. She was at our school. Um, she attended our assembly. She interacted with the children, with the teachers. She uh, ate the special, uh, special food uh, that was served in Kerala. And 
uh, it was a real fun hosting her. Very adaptable person. And by the time she was leaving, she said, why not we have an exchange, letter exchange program between my students and your students. So I readily agreed and we started it. And that was another fantastic experience. And we could know the students on either side. The students could also know each other. And I compiled the whole thing, all the letters, and uh, gave it a title, an epistolary exchange of tradition and culture between student ambassadors. This particular project gained national recognition and it won me the KVS uh, Innovation and Experimentation Award. Barb had done a lot of work for that for, uh, as a collaborator. Then that was uh, the personal side. So again, we kept in touch. We did not lose touch. And we thought of uh, beginning the um, uh, epistolary exchange once more. But due to the pandemic, we could not, we started it in fact, with the present 11 standard batch, but we could not continue due to the pandemic. Let's see whether we'll be able to take up some other project in the days to come. And Barb has promised me that she'll be coming to Kerala uh, after two years, maybe one and a half to two years. Barb, you are always welcome. So that is about Barb and now, we, I move on to her profile. Mrs. Barbara Miller is a veteran teacher from Mansi, Indiana, United States, who has taught English language arts for 24 years. Her experiences range from teaching grade seven through college level pre-service teachers. Barb has taught remedial, general education, and high ability students in middle and high school courses, advanced placement courses, and dual credit, that is high school university classes in three different school systems. Barb has supervised six university pre-service teachers and mentored 16 first year teachers. She enjoys integrating project-based learning in a curriculum to provide lasting connections between students and their curriculum skills. She's a teacher consultant for Indiana Writing Project, a local site of the National Writing Project, and has participated in several international teacher programs. Outside of school, Bob is a mother of five, a grandmother of one, a writer, and an herb gardener. I would like to add that she is a caring daughter, a loving wife, an affectionate mother, an adorable grandmother, and overall, a wonderful human being. Yes, Bob, I don't want to stand between you and the rest, so I hand over the stage to you. Right. Okay, can you hear me? Thumbs yes, up. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, very good, very good. Thank you very much, um, Principal. Thank you, um, Mujib. Thank you, Rugmini, for such a, a beautiful introduction and wonderful welcome. I'm so excited to spend uh, the morning. Uh, it's evening here, but morning with readers, um, talking about books and how to how to understand them a little bit better. This is a problem that we're having in some of our classrooms here in the US. And so I'm very excited to be able to share with you a new strategy uh, for taking a look at fictional books and making them more accessible to students. So I would like to try to start, if I may, with a poll. Now let's see if I can accomplish this. I'm going to send out a poll to you and I am ready to launch it. So you may choose as many answers as you wish. So you should see that poll now. Somebody give me a thumbs up if you see it. 
There we go. Okay. Why do you read fiction? To relax. Yes. We'll leave that open for a few moments here as we think about some of the reasons. Um, and you may choose as many reasons as you wish. Some people read for different reasons. Okay. So today I'd like to talk about noticing signposts in fiction. And noticing the signposts in fiction is something that will help you build your reading comprehension. This is something that I teach in my classrooms. In fact, today I taught my 11th grade students about signposts in nonfiction. So this is something that we use um, regularly in our classrooms. We know that reading fiction is fun. It helps us understand each other. It helps us make sense of the world as we read various titles. And it teaches us universal truths, things that are true no matter where you live, whether you're in Kerala, whether you're in Indiana, um, or whether you're in Antarctica. Um, it speaks to the human condition. And so this is one of the reasons that, that we enjoy reading fiction. But sometimes there are problems with reading fiction. Many times if students are challenged by the vocabulary or if they are challenged by the length of sentences or descriptive passages, sometimes students skim over that difficult text. They just don't read that part. And when they skim over the difficult parts, they miss the important information, clues about how characters develop, what internal and external conflicts are being conveyed in the text. And when they miss those characterization elements and conflicts, oftentimes they miss the larger themes. And it's those themes that really teach us about life. So I propose to you that using the signposts for reading fiction from a book called Notice and Note, which I have here beside me, that these signposts will help readers of all ages engage in text more, comprehend, understand it more, and ultimately enjoy it more. So today, I'd like to talk about these signposts. I'd like to share a simple children's book with you as a mentor text. That mentor text is the text we will refer back to because it's short, it's simple, but it also has the examples of every one of these signposts. And then after we discuss that mentor text, that children's book, I'd like for you to go into a breakout room to talk with your reading club members about how you might see these signposts in the books that you are currently reading or books that you have read recently. So that's how we'll be spending our time together. I mentioned that I showed you the book, Notice and Note. This is a book written by two former classroom teachers, Kyleen Beers, a woman, and a man, Robert Probst. These are currently college professors. And they noticed that many US students were not engaging sufficiently in fictional reading. And they were very concerned about this. Um, because as you, just as you have tests um, in India, we also have uh, government tests that students have to perform well on. And Probst and Beers realized that students were not reading as fully and as at high, a high enough level um, to perform well on the tests. And so they did some observations of students in classrooms and they saw students were not reading, they were not comprehending the text well, 
and they were not interested in discussing the text. When I heard that there were so many students in your reading club, I was amazed because in the US, we could not get a reading club to have so many students who were interested. So kudos to you um, for being so interested in reading. That's tremendous. So Beers and Probst, these two university professors, decided to interview 2,300 teachers. And they asked those teachers, what are the novels, the fictional pieces that you typically teach to your students? And they identified the 50 most taught novels from grades four through 12. They read these 50 books, they pored over these books, and they discovered that there were about 10 common traits that these books had. Now, I teach high school English. We call these devices, literary devices. And um, some of the teachers then gave Probst and Beers some feedback and said, 10 is too many. You need to narrow it down. And so these two researchers narrowed it down to the six most common, what they called signposts in fiction. Now, what do they mean by signpost? They mean, they mean elements in the text that a student could recognize that would then help point the student toward deeper understanding. So let me show you some of the titles of the books that these, uh, these professors analyzed. Perhaps you, you have read some of these or you recognize some of these. Um, my, my ninth grade students right now are reading Romeo and Juliet. Um, our students read many of these titles, Night, Animal Farm, The Crucible, of course, is a play, The Great Gatsby, Lord of the Flies, To Kill a Mockingbird. So these are titles that my students read as well. So they discovered that it was not just about teaching the signposts, it was also about developing reading communities. And that's what I imagine that your reading club is, an opportunity for students to come together and to discuss the books that they're reading. Sometimes students were reading the same book and other times students were reading different books. But because all books share these signposts, these elements that help readers have a deeper understanding, the students could discuss the books even if they were different. And what they decided um, after observing students in these reading communities is that the best reading communities incorporate and offer opportunity for deep conversations about the text. And that means that students have to read it very closely. They have to look um, carefully at the words that are chosen. They also, in the reading communities, discovered that students who had strong respect for one another, who could disagree with each other politely, um, and yet maintain that respect for each other, came away understanding books in a deeper way. So they were also determined that taking a very close examination of a text was very helpful, that using higher order thinking and what that looks like is answering and asking questions that include how and why, not simply talking about what happens in a story, but why it happens and how it happens and how the writer creates that story and why by referring back to what we call textual evidence, the actual words from the book. All of those things helped students make connections to themselves in the books they were reading, connections to other texts which could include books or 
movies, films, television programs, even music, and also make connections to the world. And, and isn't that really why we read? So they are promoting reading communities. And I'm going to try another poll here. I think I got kicked out um, of Zoom the last time, but I'm going to try it again. So I have a second poll for you. So let me give that a try here. I'd like to know from you, who all are members of a reading community, what are the top three top three qualities of a reading community in your opinion? Okay, so I've listed some, choose the top three. I'm very interested to know if what you think makes a great community is what our two professors also um, believe. So I am sending that poll out to you now. I hope you can see it. Thumbs up, anybody see the poll? There we go. Uh, Ma'am, I submitted my poll. We'll leave the poll open for just a bit longer. We have 78% participation. Well, now we're up to 85%. Okay. Leave it open for just another moment or two. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now and share the results with you. So 76% of you believe that deep conversations are an important part of a reading community. And I have to agree with that. Um, if you're going to take the time to read a book, most of us want to talk about that book and talk about the ideas that are in it. The respect for all participants, I also agree with. I think that's very, very important. I tell my students that we have to feel safe in our classroom, not only physically safe, but we have to feel emotionally safe, that the things that we share, um, other people will respect and not laugh at, um, because it's those conversations that take our, our beliefs and take um, us as human beings to a higher level. That's what helps us grow. As we think about things, we try on ideas, we discuss and we, we politely debate with others. Um, that is just such an important part of, of learning and growing and living, uh, no matter what age you are. Okay, I think I can stop sharing that now and close that. There we go, okay. So let's talk about these signposts. Now, if you have a piece of paper, I'd really like for you to write this down because in just a bit, I'm going to ask you to be looking for examples of these signposts in the video that I will be playing for you. So if you can write, write um, now, this would be a great time to do that. So the first signpost that Beers and Probst came up with, they called contrast and contradictions. Contrast and contradictions. Things that are different. They are not what we would expect. Now, in my high school classroom, I call that irony. And I also call that juxtaposition. I don't know if you know that word or not. You can, I think you can send me a thumbs up. Um, if, you, if this sounds like this is something familiar. Thank you. So juxtap- uh, this new yes. one sounds alien to me. So could you explain this? I'm sorry, I could not, I could not understand that. Ma'am, sorry, this word called juxtaposition was a bit alien to me. So can you explain it a bit? Yes, let me talk about that. 
juxtaposition are is when a writer chooses to put two things next to each other that that seem unusual or that seem to be misplaced and a writer does that to draw attention to those two things and to make a larger point and so this is what this is what contrast and contradiction is about things in a novel in a story that that are either surprising because they sh they don't go together or they uh, contradict each other okay now now it could be a behavior that seems very odd for a particular character um it could it could be um people who are together who normally would not be put together it could be events things that happen that are um, happening simultaneously at the same time or that are happening um, sequentially one after another that don't seem like they fit okay that's contrast and contradiction Contrast, of course, is how things are different, right? Okay, so that's the first signpost. And so the professors tell us that if we can look for contrast and contradiction in the reading, this will give us a clue to something. Okay, so we want to watch for that sign signpost. And the name of the book that these uh, professors wrote is Notice and Note. Notice and Note. Notice that in the text that you're reading and make a note of it. Write it down because it's important. Notice and Note. So these are the signposts that we should notice and note, take a note of. Now, the second one is called words of the wiser. That makes very, very easy sense. It's some advice that a mentor character is giving another character. It also could, at a high school level, could appear as a quotation, uh, perhaps from a, um, a, a a famous book or a famous philosopher or writer, sometimes we, we will find in fiction that a character admires someone and will um, have a quotation that inspires that character. Okay, so words of the wiser, the advice of a mentor, a mentor is usually older, um, not always, but usually older, if we think of archetypal characters, we um, often think of um, wizards or wise, wise old men with long beards or uh, uh, wise women, um, but they're generally older characters, not always, but generally so. So when we're reading and we come across advice, that an older character is giving a younger character. We want to stop. We want to note that, write it down, and think about why would this character be giving advice? And how will this impact the story? So that's number two. Number three, the professors call again and again. Now, in my high school classroom, we call that repetition. You probably call it that too, repetition. So it can be repetition of many things. We know when a writer repeats something that it's important. So we wanna pay attention. We wanna notice that and we wanna note it. So it could be repetition of specific words, it could be repetition of particular phrases, sentences. It could be something that becomes a symbol later on. It could even be events, things that happen 
the similar kind of thing happens again and again. That's a tip off to us as readers that it's important. And so we want to ask ourselves, why is the writer having this repetition occur again and again? Okay, so we'll come back to that. Number four is the aha moment. Aha moment. Aha! It's a realization. Uh, it's, a, it's a sudden understanding of something. We call that epiphany in my classroom epiphany. And so the aha moment is the time when a character suddenly realizes something. Aha. Okay. So this is important. And I will talk a bit more about this in a moment. The aha moment is often related to the theme, the message that the fictional story is trying to convey. Number five, tough questions, tough questions. Now, what the professors mean by this is not just any question. It is not just any general question that a character asks. It's something that is deep, that is philosophical, that, that touches the heart of a character, um, in my classroom, we would call those rhetorical questions because there's not always an easy answer for that. Sometimes characters ask questions of other characters because they want them to think. It's these tough questions, difficult questions, hard questions that don't have easy answers. These are the questions that we're interested in. And the last one is called the memory moment, memory moment. In my classroom, we would call that a flashback where the story is, is happening, the events are happening, and then suddenly it flashes back in time and we learn about something that happened earlier. So there's a reason that the writer has included the flashback. If it's not important to the story and to the theme and to the development of the character, the writer would not have flashed back to that moment. In some uh, cases, we might call that backstory. I don't know if you know that term or use that term, backstory. It's just the history um, of a situation or of uh, a character that we call that backstory. So these are the six signposts, all right? Um, so what I would like to do is I'd like to talk just a little bit about each one, if I may, and then I'd like to uh, share the book with you, okay? And while um, I'm sharing a little bit more information about each one, um, you may certainly take notes, then I'm going to be asking you to look for examples of each of these in the story that we're going to read. Okay, so once again, contrast and contradiction. <clears throat> this is what I would call irony in my classroom. This is very helpful to understand how the character is changing. If the character is behaving in a different way, there's a reason for that. So that would be a contrast or a contradiction. Um, it might have something to do with a conflict inside the character, internal conflict. There also might be some contrast in the setting, uh, the place, the location, the time, um, the context of what's happening. And it's also possible that this can help you understand the plot, which is just the this, this sequence of events, this, uh, the story as it moves along. Um, so one good question to ask is, why would the character feel or behave this way? You notice it, you note it, 
And then you ask, why is the character feeling or behaving this way? If the contrast is in, this, in the setting, why would the writer want us to know about the contrast? Why would the writer want us to see this difference in the setting? Okay, so that's contrast and contradictions. Words of the wiser. So remember, this is the one with the mentor, the wise person who's giving advice. This is very helpful to understand characterization, okay? Because we have the character development of our main character, our protagonist. So if that character is being given advice, okay, how is that going to change the character? The character doesn't change, there's not a story right? The character has to learn something usually and make some kind of a change. And then either the character learns a lesson or we as readers learn the lesson by watching the character. The words of the wiser often also echo the theme, the lesson, the message. So words of the wiser are important to pay attention to. Here's repetition again and again. This is helpful for us to understand um, the plot because sometimes events happen again and again and the character begins to see there's a pattern and begins to understand himself better. It also helps us understand characterization. If a character is doing the same thing over and over and over again, we want to ask ourselves, why does this keep happening? Why does this character keep behaving in this way? That's going to help us get into that character's brain, into that character's mind a little bit more. And then I also, because remember, if it's being repeated, it's important, it probably will connect to the theme, the message, uh, the lesson of the book. Here's the aha moment. Okay, this is the epiphany in a high school classroom in the US. So this aha moment helps, helps readers identify the character's behavior and the conflict. Okay, so this is the time when the character's figuring things out. Oh, yes, understanding something. Now I realize, or now I understand, these are signal words that can help readers see the aha moment. And what we wanna ask this time is, how is this going to change things? How is this going to change? This is typically, a pivotal moment in the story, perhaps, perhaps right after the climactic scene, the climax of the, of the story. The character, the main character typically is understanding something. The next one is tough questions. These were those deep questions that often are um, questions that, that characters wrestle with. They're not easy to answer. So uh, the professor suggests that we think about when, when we see it, a tough question that we notice it, we note it, and then we ask ourselves, what does this make me wonder about? What does this make me wonder about regarding this book? So the tough question is going to help, the answer to that tough question will help readers understand the theme because it's generally the answer to that tough question that the protagonist, the main character is struggling with. And that will be a part of the theme. So it's going to relate to conflict and it will relate to the theme. The last one is that memory moment, memory moment, a flashback or backstory. So this helps us think about how far the character has come because we understand where the character has been before. 
It can also help us understand setting, time, place, and context, what's going on. And sometimes it can help us with the theme, helping us understand the growth a character has, what a character is learning. What a character is learning is oftentimes the theme. A memory moment can also help us make predictions. And of course, good readers are always predicting as they read. So notice that, note it and think, why is this important? Why does the writer include this flashback or this backstory information? Okay, so you all have some, uh, at this point, have some good notes. I'd like to share this, this book with you. This is a um, very classic children's story um, here in the US and it's about six minutes long. And as we're watching this, I'd like you to try to find examples of these different, these different signposts. Every one of the signposts is in this book. So I'd like you to see if you can find those and um, when we're finished, I'll share a few that I found, and then I'd like to see if some of you are able to share those that you found as well. Okay, so let me, uh, let me begin and, and about, you take notes, and then we'll come back together to discuss the signposts that you notice. The Little House, written and illustrated by Virginia Lee Burton. Once upon a time, there was a little house way out in the country. She was a pretty little house and she was strong and well built. The little house was very happy as she sat on the hill and watched the countryside around her. She watched the sun rise in the morning and she watched the sun set in the evening. In the nights, she watched the moon grow from a thin new moon to a full moon, then back again to a thin old moon. And when there was no moon, she watched the stars. Way off in the distance, she could see the lights of the city. The little house watched the countryside slowly change with the seasons. In the spring, she waited for the first robin. She watched the grass turn green. She watched the buds on the trees swell and the apple trees burst into blossom. She watched the children playing in the brook. In the long summer days, she sat in the sun and watched the trees cover themselves with leaves and white daisies cover the hill. She watched the apples turn red and ripen. She watched the children swimming in the pool. In the fall, she watched the first frost turn the leaves to bright yellow and orange and red. She watched the harvest gathered and the apples picked. She watched the children going back to school. In the winter, she watched the children coasting and skating. Year followed year. The apple trees grew old and the new ones were planted. Now at night, the lights of the city seemed brighter and closer. One day, the little house was surprised to see a horseless carriage coming down the winding country road. Pretty soon, there were more of them on the road and fewer carriages pulled by horses. Pretty soon, along came a steam shovel and it dug a road through the hill covered with daisies. Then some trucks with tar and sand. And finally, a steamroller came and rolled it all smooth and the road was done. Now the little house watched the trucks and automobiles going back and forth to the city. Gasoline stations, roadside stands, and small houses followed the new road. Everyone and everything moved much faster now than before. More roads were made and more houses and bigger houses, apartment houses and tenement houses, schools, stores, and garages crowded the little house. No one wanted to live in her and take care of her anymore. Now it was not so quiet and peaceful at night. 
Now the lights of the city were bright and very close and the street lights shone all night. The little house missed the field of daisies and the apple trees dancing in the moonlight. Pretty soon there were trolley cars going back and forth in front of the little house all day and part of the night. Everyone seemed to be very busy and everyone seemed to be in a hurry. Pretty soon there was an elevated train going back and forth above the little house. The air was filled with dust and smoke. Now she couldn't tell when spring came or summer or fall or winter. It all seemed about the same. Pretty soon there was a subway going back Pretty soon they tore down the apartment houses and tenement houses around the little house. Pretty soon they started building up. They built up 25 stories on one side and 35 stories on the other. Now the little house only saw the sun at noon and didn't see the moon or stars at night at all. At night she used to dream of the country and the field of daisies and the apple trees dancing in the moonlight. The little house was very sad and lonely. Her windows were broken and her shutters hung crookedly. She looked shabby, though she was just as good a house as ever underneath. Then one fine morning in spring, along came the great, great granddaughter of the man who built the little house so well. She saw the shabby little house, but she didn't hurry by. She said to her husband, that looks just like the little house my grandmother lived in when she was a little girl. Only that little house was way out in the country. They found out it was the very same house, so they went to the movers to see if the little house could be moved. The movers said, sure, this little house is as good as ever. She's built so well we could move her anywhere. So they jacked up the little house and put her on wheels. At first, the little house was frightened, but after she got used to it, she rather liked it. They rolled along the big road, and they rolled along the little roads until they were way out in the country. Finally, they saw a little hill in the middle of a field and apple trees growing around. There, said the great, great granddaughter, that's just the place. Yes, it is, said the little house to herself. The windows and shutters were fixed and once again, they painted her a lovely shade of pink. The little house smiled happily. Once again, she could watch the sun and moon and stars. Once again, she could watch spring and summer and fall and winter come and go. Once again, she was lived in and taken care of. The stars twinkled above her. A new moon was coming. It was spring and all was quiet and peaceful in the country. Thanks for listening and don't forget to subscribe. Okay. So let's get uh, started. I know we're close on time. We don't have a lot of time left. So I would share with you that there are some contrasts and contradictions in this. We have the contrast of the dark uh, sky in, in the country where the little house lives to begin with and the lights from the city. Okay, that's going to cause some conflict later on. So if we think about the contradictions, then we understand some conflict. We also understand the setting. I would say that, um, Maybe I'll go down to this bottom one. The little house cannot tell anymore when she's in the city, when the seasons change because the buildings are on either side of her. So that's conflict. And it's also characterization. If you think of the house as a character, right? She now has lost what was important to her, okay? And so we understand how that story is progressing and how that character is changing if we think about the contrast and contradictions. Um, I don't know if we can try this or not. Would somebody like to share another example of contrast and contradictions? Um, let's see, how will we do that? Um, share, put your hand up maybe, we can unmute you or something. Najib, will that work? Uh, yes, ma'am. They can un unmute themselves and speak. Anyone? Ma'am, uh, ma I can't find any. 
No, ma'am, I can't find, I don't have any more examples. Yes, but ma'am, I have one. Yes, Kailas, go ahead. Uh, so, ma'am, I think uh, when the little house was moved, first she didn't like being moved, but then she started liking the journey. I think that could be counted as contradiction. Was that surprising that the house went back? Um, actually, the house didn't go back. The house, the city encroached on the house, right, in the story. And then the house was pulled out and moved away to the, to the country. But that is a contrast that the house went from being enclosed and then went back to being in an open area in the country. So that, that is part of, um, yes, that's a great example. Great example of contrast. Um, let's go to the words of the wiser. Um, so in the beginning, we hear this little house shall never be sold for gold or silver. Silver, She will live to see our great, great grandchildren's great, great grandchildren living in her. Maybe this has something to do with the theme. Maybe there's a theme about about preserving our, our heritage. Um, we also hear the great, great granddaughter say there when she finds the hill for the little house to, to be placed on, that's just the place. And so perhaps there's something to do, a, a theme that we could extract from this story that has something to do with finding your place. Is this a story about finding your place, finding the place that best suits you? In that way, this story is somewhat symbolic, isn't it? Okay, so if we think about that signpost repetition again and again, did you notice at the beginning that the little house watches and watches and watches and the days repeat and the seasons repeat? Okay, so we get that sense of her, the little house as a character being comfortable in that rhythm of life. Um, there's another example I, that I was thinking of. Um, there are more and more vehicles that come out and, and begin to surround um, the little house as the roads are being built. And so that is representative of conflict. So we ask ourselves, why is the writer putting in all of these vehicles, more and more and more vehicles? Well, because it's a conflict, all right? It's causing conflict in the plot. Um, Rugmini and Mujib, I'm concerned about the time. It's okay, ma'am. You may go ahead. Okay. You can continue. You can continue. Yeah, if it is okay with okay. you, no problem. Yeah, the problem is with you. I think it's yes. around eleven day, eleven thirty. Yeah. I'm I'm fine. I just don't want to keep students longer than than we promised we would would keep them. Oh. It's okay, madam. It's okay. Oh, mom, yeah. yes, ma is it okay? Yes, so if someone needs to leave, no, okay. feel free to leave. Is that okay? Uh, yes, madam. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so how about the aha moment? Aha, this is the epiphany. Um, so there are at least two of those. Um, one of them is when the, the great, great granddaughter is in town and, and it says, something made her stop and look again. And she says, that little house looks just like the little house my grandmother lived in when she was a girl. Aha, she recognizes the house. Okay, and this is really part of the plot. Isn't this part of the climactic scene when the little house realizes she's going to be rescued? Someone is going to save that little house from having to live in this place that she does not want to live where she's not happy. And then it extends, the aha moment extends to when the little, the great, great granddaughter finds just the perfect place for the little house to be placed out in the country on the hill. And 
the great, great granddaughter says that the little house is in just the right place. And the little house thinks, yes, it is the perfect place. She has found the perfect place for herself. She knows where she needs to be. So again, this helps us understand the idea of theme. Did anybody else hear an aha moment? A time when some character realized something? Typically, there are not many of those because they are going to be critical in the plot uh, for the understanding and development of the character. There was only one tough question that I came across that I could identify. Maybe you heard uh, uh, some different ones. I, I was listening and realized that the great, great granddaughter went to the movers to see, to ask if the little house could be moved. Is it possible to move the little house? That's a, a tricky question because if we think about this as an allegory, uh, a story where things are all symbols, um, maybe, maybe this is the idea of can you make, a, can, you, can you change something in your life? Can you make that change? Um, and in this case, yes, yes. Um, it's going to be possible for this little house to have a change in her life. Memory moment, memory moment. She dreams of her former life in the country. She's in the city. These tall skyscrapers are all around. She cannot see the sun. She cannot experience the, the seasons. She's very, very unhappy, right? But she dreams, she flashes back to her former life in the country, all right? So this is, helps us understand this conflict, this memory moment helps us understand how, how much she misses that time. So this goes toward the, climb, uh, the conflict and it helps escalate the mood. I didn't include mood there, but it does. It escalates the mood. It, it, it makes the mood more intense so that, so that we can experience that climactic moment of unhappiness with the little house. Did anybody hear another memory moment? Ma'am, Ma'am, uh, when she, the little house uh, finally does find that perfect place, it reminds her of her old place with the apple trees, so. Yes. It, Yes, very good, very good. And that makes kind of a circular connection to back to the beginning, doesn't it? Uh, Bob, yeah. there's one more moment. Uh, I think where the daughter, great great granddaughter, thinks of her grandmother's house, the one that she had lived in. So she's recollecting. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes. very good, very good. Yes, that's an excellent, excellent um, observation. And so that also creates part of that circle, that idea of, of our um, heritage and how we honor the past. So we could think of, probably we could create a theme about this idea of honoring our past, honoring where we've been and where it takes us. We could create a theme from this book, I suspect, about choices in life. And uh, we could create a theme about the idea of progress and Change. expansion, urban expansion, how, how, cities, how cities encroach on other um, country places. We could, um, we could even make... Um, a theme about ecology. My friend who, who shared this book with me um, said when she taught this book to her elementary students, they always talked about ecology because remember in the city how 
the little house, uh, it was dirty and it was smoky and she, uh, there was so much pollution. And so the students read it and, and created themes, lessons about, about that. So by taking these different six different signposts, I think we have a deeper understanding of this book than it just being a simple children's story. Um, and I would encourage you to apply these, these um, different, different signposts to the fiction that you're reading. Um, and I made a chart to kind of show how um, the contrast and contradiction is probably the best one because it, it has a bearing on so many different aspects of the story, of the plot, the setting, the characters, the conflict. Um, the words of the wiser impacts characters and theme. Repetition is pretty important. Um, it can connect to the plot, help us understand the characters as well as the theme. And you can see by looking at that last column that many of these help, help readers understand theme. My students have the hardest time understanding theme. And so if they, if they will pay attention to these signposts in the fiction that they're reading, then it's much easier to have those deep conversations, respectful conversations um, that will help them glean more, gain more from the novels, the fiction that they're reading. Now, I had planned to put you into breakout rooms so that you could talk about your own books and how perhaps you have seen some of these signposts in your books. Is that something that you would like to do? Or would perhaps you like to share, save that for another club meeting that you have? Mujib, what are your thoughts? Yeah, Kailas, he was telling something. Not really, sir. Okay, uh, so uh, students, what would you like to do? do you, uh, would you like to have an activity, breakout room activity? Yes, or shall we, shall yes, we do sir, it? In, yes, uh, okay, okay. So we will uh, try that if it's okay, uh, Barbara. I do have one last poll, and I, I okay. hope that you will um, perhaps give me a moment to um, initiate that. I'm really curious to know uh, your reaction to these, um, to these different signposts. So if I may, um, if, you're, if you are able to stay with us, yeah, I'd yeah, like to yes, start. Yeah, madam, you can continue. Sure. You can continue, madam. Yes, ma'am. Sure, ma'am. Okay. Yes, yes. I'd like to start with the last one. Which signpost do you feel would be most helpful for you um, to get more knowledge and understanding from fiction? I've just launched that poll for you. Which one? Which signpost would be most helpful? Contrast and contradiction, words of the wiser. Again and again, that's the repetition, aha moment, tough questions, or the flashback memory moment. Oh, nobody likes repetition. Oh, there's someone else. Okay. 80%. I agree. I think contrasts and contradictions um, happens to be the strongest of them um, because it applies to so many different areas. So if you had just one, if you just used one of these and were you know, noticing and noting the contradictions and the contrasts in what you read, I think you would find that your understanding and your interest in your your novels and the fiction that you're reading would, would increase dramatically. Um, and this is of course something that you can use in your reading clubs as well um, to discuss what are the contrasts and contradictions that we're finding throughout, um, throughout the stories. 
Okay, so I am happy to uh, let uh, Rumini and Mujib take over. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them if I can hear them well. I'm getting a lot of feedback and, and um, voices are breaking up. Uh, so perhaps you'd rather do it in the chat um, if you have a question. But I will defer now to uh, Mujib and to Rigmini. And I want to thank you so much for letting me share this with you. I, I love to talk with students and I love to share new ideas about how to look at, at uh, reading and how to look at writing. So thank you very much for, for uh, hosting me this morning. Um, Bob, I would like to uh, get a feedback from the children. Uh, shall I ask a representative to give the feedback? Yes. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Sure. Okay, Yutika. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, it was a wonderful session. Really very good. We felt very comfortable. And we could learn, uh, we could know, and we could get an insight about how we can, you know, uh, get to know the book in a better way and understand the theme, understand the book so that we can connect to the book and to the character as well. Uh, so uh, when I, when I uh, heard you uh, speaking, I, I thought, I think I did uh, look for signposts without knowing that I was actually looking for it. And, um, at the, but I could also learn some new signposts and uh, I could understand that maybe if I look for those signposts, maybe I could understand the book better. So it was, it was very good. It was put forth in a wonderful manner that we could understand. Uh, we could, uh, it was very, uh, it was a comfortable and happy session I felt. It was very good. Man. Thank you so much for spending your time uh, for us. Even though it's a night time there. I'm, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank, thank you, you night, nearing midnight. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> and it was really wonderful, and I'm uh, pretty sure that everyone will have uh, enjoyed it. And they will be able to make use of it in, when uh, they are reading the text for analyzing, and it will improve their critical thinking also. Uh, thank you very much, Barbara, for spending your valuable time with us today and interacting with our students. Really, we really appreciate it. Yes, um, we are looking forward yeah. for more such such. Yes. <laughs> Anyone else would like to speak, children? One or two lines? If you want to, you can um, express. Yes, ma'am. Uh, sorry if the video, uh, sorry if the audio quality is a bit low, but today's class was fantastic as far as the teaching is concerned. And it, I got to learn something new and, with, and using this, I can understand the book a bit better. Without knowing, I've been using these things uh, even before for reading more novels, but I didn't understand. I use these elements to read the books. So, yeah, now I know how I how to read novels, etc. a bit more confidently and professionally. Professionally. Yeah, and I hope, uh, children, you have noticed that small story, which we will yes, read, sir. just enjoy and uh, just forgot, uh, that is giving so, so much of insights, uh, just like uh, Barbara said about our heritage, preserving our yes. heritage and the future shock, the changes, rapid changes in the society that is affecting us, our emotions. Shall we? Um, yes, yeah, it's already I, too late. We will not. Yeah, uh, yeah right. Okay. Okay, Bob, thanks a lot. It was a wonderful session. I was also looking forward to it. And uh, even as a teacher of English, I could, and I'm sure that those uh, teachers of English who have attended uh, this session would agree with me uh, that these are some new techniques that we can introduce in our classes also so that uh, the children can become better readers. And Mujib, I think our break. Uh,